thanks, Tiffany, for the comments. And, you know, kind of just elaborating what I said at the beginning of the presentation, when I, when I first started in practice in my primary care office, I kind of realized a lot of the basics of what I was taught, just simple diagnosis and, and kind of picking pills or referring to specialists. For treatments didn't work, so I, re I really spent years exploring what does work. So when it comes to the core of a treatment plan to deal with chronic disease, this is not something necessarily I created. Uh, this has been looked at by many folks, but these four pillars were the four things that people can control. These And, and I found you really can't get success no matter what supplements you use, what tests you do, what medicines you use, you just can't get success uh, when dealing with chronic disease or preventing chronic disease without thinking about these four pillars. So food, obviously it starts with what you put in your body and it's not just what diet is right, it's is your food nourishing? Does your food give you the minerals, vitamins, nutrients, macro nutrients that, that your body needs to simply survive and run? I mean. People may have heard the, the common analogy of if your body is a machine, if you just put water in your car, it's not going to run. You have to give it the fuel it wants and the appropriate type of fuel. Uh, the human body is no different. So what you eat is so important, but also how you eat. Um, most of us now eat just at a computer with our phone in our hand, and, and we're not digesting food when we're distracted eating with some presence of mind or what we call mindful eating is so important. So those are some of the basics there. Movement, again, just a crucial thing. The body's designed to move. And it doesn't mean there's a one best exercise plan, but movement has to be part of someone's world. Maybe they're dealing with severe pain and movement might just be pool exercises or chair exercises. But over time, we want to continue to build movement, fuel the joints, just get the body moving. Relaxation, throughout history, throughout all cultures, relaxation was probably easier to do, even though survival was worse uh, throughout most of history for people. Um, essentially, we weren't turned on 24-7. Now, with technology and electricity, the last you know, couple hundred years, or really 150 years, we're always on. And so we have to get our body out of this fight or flight response. And so for some people, that's nature. For some people, it's meditation. For some people, it's just talking to a friend. But we need tools to get us out of fight or, fight or flight because the opposite of fight or flight is rest and repair. And our body needs that time to rest and repair. So uh, sleep falls into that relaxation category as well. These are building blocks. And finally, community this is a newer one for me. I didn't really pick up on this early in my career. A lot of focus on food and movement, relaxing. Those were kind of staples for most of the last 15, 20 years of my medical career. Communities newer started looking at research and actually learned that social isolation is a bigger risk factor for chronic diseases like heart disease and cancer than is smoking or obesity, poor diet. Uh, and social isolation or what you might call loneliness on one level is hugely prevalent. And obviously now with, with COVID, we're seeing a lot of the ramifications of that. And so finding community in your life, um, it could be an online community. Technology is not always bad. It can be a great resource, but those are the simply key pillars. And, and again, just to elaborate, I, I found people don't get better unless they're finding ways to incorporate. And for a lot of folks, just making changes in those areas and putting those building blocks in place um, is enough to get them better. It doesn't work overnight. So if you're looking for some more immediate results, you might need to use a medicine or a supplement or something, uh, another modality. But when you build those in, you absolutely uh, get better. And for a lot of people, it just simply works. And these are all things we can control and start quickly. Um, actually, if, if uh, there's there's a little um what am i trying to say on my website if you click on the the link that says uh start four pillars today not so much scheduling appointments I, to be honest i'll have to look at my website and terminology is it uh it says i will go there right now it says oh click here in the upper right corner want the path to optimal health click here it's a little like six, eight page handout that just goes through those four pillars 
and give some really simple suggestions that can be started today to, to kind of implement those tools. So a question, what would you say are the top three ailments, symptoms, diseases that are research back for THC, CBD, and, or, or both? Um, so for CBD, that's pretty easy, it's seizures. Uh, that's far and away where the, the best research now, again, the best research is seizures in pediatric conditions. Uh, and the best research is in some pretty rare uh, pediatric conditions. And those are what I, when I say the best research, I mean big, large scale, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. Um, th there's, there's quite a bit of data on CBD and pediatric seizures. Um, there is some data less robust and certainly a fair amount of, of patient responses and great clinical experience um, and laboratory data on CBD for adult seizures as well. We know how and why it works uh, in, in adult seizures, less large-scale clinical trials. Um, when it comes to CBD, um, there's some data on um, anxiety, performance anxiety, and just generalized anxiety. Um, those use pretty high dosages of CBD isolate, meaning just pure CBD, nothing else in it. Um, in practice, we tend to find CBD is very effective for anxiety, but we often don't need the dosages that um, have been used in, in clinical trials, especially when we use what we call full spectrum products. When it comes to THC, uh, some of the best research is on pain, um, especially neuropathic pain and the pain associated with spasticity uh, of multiple sclerosis. Um, Chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is where, specifically chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is where a lot of the hard clinical trials have been. But both in smaller studies and then certainly in anecdotal studies, we see THC benefiting for a wide range of not, uh, causes of nausea, not specifically chemotherapy nausea. Uh, I would also say both THC and CBD for pain, uh, the drug Sativex, which is again a prescription drug, a one-to-one -one extract available in about 30 countries, unfortunately not in the United States. Um, multiple studies looking at pain there and uh, MS spasticity, so that THC CBD combination has been shown in, in good thorough clinical trials to be beneficial. Um, and again, in, in more clinical experience and patient experience, we see that one-to-one -one ratio be pretty effective. So it's not surprising that kind of our, our anecdotal data tracks what we've seen in uh, the clinical space. Uh, PTSD is another one where we've seen benefit both with THC and CBD. I would say those are the biggest ones that have the best research. Uh, there's a couple reviews. If you Google National uh, Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, there was a 2017 big kind of comprehensive review that looked at the conditions uh, where cannabis showed the most effectiveness, really looking at specifically only randomized uh, placebo-controlled trials. Um, and that's where you'll see some of that data come out. Uh, another question I've heard Few people say they're very sensitive to THC, even the low amounts found in full spectrum CBD. Is that a genetic thing? Is it possible to reduce that sensitivity uh, over time? So I've, I've definitely seen some people say that sensitive, even to these tiny amounts in full spectrum CBD. I would say in well-tested full spectrum CBD, where we really know how much THC is in there, um, I really don't run into people who really can't tolerate that, um, even those who are sensitive. Uh, I think a lot of the situations where people run into uh, problems with CBD products, it's just poor products, meaning there's much more THC in there than, than on the label, but it's absolutely possible for people to be highly sensitive. That's a genetic thing. There's various genetics involved. So uh, some of that is increased conversion of plain old, uh, Delta 9 THC to something called 11 hydroxy THC. When you swallow cannabis, when you swallow THC, eventually it goes to the liver and the liver is gonna convert a bunch of that THC to 11 hydroxy THC. 11 hydroxy is more potent and causes more psychoactivity than just plain Delta 9 THC. So people genetically who over convert 
are going to have increased levels of 11 hydroxy thc and they're going to be much more sensitive uh, so that's one genetics there's also genetics on just the cannabis receptor what we call the cb1 receptor that's the one in the brain that's associated with the intoxicating effects if people have certain mutations in that um, they can be potentially more sensitive to thc there's also genetic mutations just in general how you break down and get rid of thc uh, and so that's what, when the question was asked earlier about genetic tests, um, there are tests that try to look at some of those factors. Again, they're not perfect, but those tests would likely show just some genetic, uh, what we call SNPs or, or polymorphisms um, that show that increased sensitivity. And in terms of reducing it, um, for most people, yes. When you use THC on a consistent basis, starting very low, or to, let me just say not necessarily starting low, starting at a dose you tolerate, uh, then over time, you can actually build up tolerance to a lot of the negative effects, the intoxicating effects, psychoactive effects, but you can still continually get benefit for a lot of its positive effects on pain, mood, other things. So we can actually absolutely start low and build up and, and essentially increase better tolerance. Uh, a follow-up to when I said very high dose of CBD isolate, at least in the... Uh, uh, anxiety study I was mentioning, the performance anxiety study, uh, they were they used 150, 300, and 600 milligrams of uh, CBD isolate with 300 milligrams was the best in that study. In the, the CBD isolate studies uh, in children for, for seizure disorders, uh, that's the prescription CBD medicine we have. Uh, it's dose milligrams per kilogram because it's pediatrics. Um, but they used up to 20 milligrams per kilogram. So uh, we're talking in a 20 some pound uh, infant, they could still be using 200 plus milligrams of CBD and in larger children, it was getting even in the 600 to 1200 milligrams of CBD. another question, what cannabinoids are you most excited about other than CBD and THC? So just to reiterate, uh, remember there, there's more cannabinoids than just THC and, and CBD. There's actually, depending on who's counting and what research you're looking at, we're up to about 140. Those aren't necessarily all prevalent in every product and some of those only are around for a very short period of time as they get metabolized to one another. But there's there's certainly several that, uh, at least a dozen that are kind of pretty well known and, and well, well isolated at this point. Um, I don't know if there's one I'm absolutely most excited about, but I guess I'll, I'll kind of comment on ones that we're, we're already using a little bit and certainly have seen benefit. Uh, one, it was, I was just about to start mentioning CBN, so your timing on that is good, Denise. Um, so one we're already using a bit is called CBN. CBN is basically what happens when THC breaks down. It forms uh, another cannabinoid called CBN, and it appears to lose most of its psychoactive effects. It just doesn't bind very well to the CB1 receptor. But via other receptor mechanisms, which aren't completely elucidated, it seems to maintain capacity. So I'll ask absolutely use CBN for folks who seem to be pretty sensitive to THC or don't really want to include it for some other reason, um, or sometimes add it on as an, as an adjunct. Some people say, oh, if I take five milligrams of THC, um, I'm sleeping much better, but if I take seven and a half, I, I don't like it, I get anxious or I get jittery and I don't sleep as well. So sometimes I'll add CBN on to uh, a regimen um, additionally. So I think CBN is one definitely that's gonna be playing a role and, and often combining it with other either botanicals or other cannabis compounds be valuable. Um, the ones that are probably pretty intriguing, which we're still learning more about are what we call the acid forms. So this is where you'll just see an A after THC or an A after CBD. So THCA, CBDA, and, and really all cannabinoids have an A form, an acid form. We used to call the acid form just the inactive form, thinking once you heat it, um, the acid gets cleaved off and that is the active form. But we found the acid form is not just inactive, it's just different. 
So the acid forms bind to receptors differently. They bind to different receptors. Uh, the acid forms seem to have effect in cancer. Uh, and there's a lot of research being looked at there. And it really appears if you incorporate the acid forms when you're trying to kill cancer cells, um, there's added benefit. Uh, THCA seems to have both anti-seizure, anti-nausea, anti-pain activity. So for, again, for people who are really sensitive to THC by itself and don't like the intoxicating effect um, and low dose uh, non-intoxicating THC doesn't really work good enough, we can add these acid forms into the mix. Uh, CBG and is another uh, one that's getting a lot of attention, a variety of effects in different areas. does seem to certainly be additive in terms of pain, um, as does CBC, another cannabinoid. Uh, so I, I, I like those being incorporated. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of just thinking these additional cannabinoids, we're going to purify them and use them in higher dose as isolated compounds. Again, at least clinical experience and a lot of the lab experience shows benefits of this entourage effect, these compounds working together. And just typically we see that with other botanicals as well, not cannabis, just the compounds in nature kind of have this synergistic effect. So I, I think there's going to be a role and I think we're going to see all these individual cannabinoids as isolated prescription medicines at some point in the next 15 years. Um, but I'm still a kind of a believer that the combination is going to be better and we're just going to breed or, or some, not synthetic, but put these compounds together um, in various combinations. But the acid forms and CBN, I'd say, are the ones kind of most excited about because we've used them the most now with CBG and CBC, uh, both having a lot of pretty valuable properties that I, that I think are going to be more effective uh, coming soon. Another question, uh, if you were looking at including a daily dose of CBD into your life for overall wellness, what would be the dosage, uh, how many times a day, um, and would you recommend isolate or, or full spectrum? Um, I've heard it's critical to use CBD regularly to achieve the benefits. What's your perspective? Um, from what I've seen um, in my experience, I think definitely high CBD extracts, or if you're using CBD isolate, consistency is, is more beneficial, especially at the more typical dosages we use. I, I would say if someone's just looking to wanting to add CBD into a regimen, not necessarily like, oh, I have to treat this pain or chronic condition. I just want to see how I feel after uh, a while. Usually what I say is starting with full spectrum. I really don't recommend isolate to anyone unless they're gonna be drug tested. So they just absolutely can't have CBD um, or they, uh, for some other reason, just can't or, or don't want THC. But again, I really, outside of rare, rare situations, I've never seen someone have a problem with a, with a full spectrum product. And I think you get that synergy. So I would always start with full spectrum usually somewhere between about 10 and 25 milligrams per dose, excuse me, and typically dose uh, two or three times a day to kind of maintain steady state. Uh, and so that's kind of the normal. And usually what I'll tell people is try that for three weeks at a minimum. Um, and you can kind of bump the dose, you know, say you start with 10 milligrams twice a day, uh, after two or three weeks, I'm not noticing much. I'm going to go to 20 or 25. Again, these are extremely safe dosages, you know, hundreds of milligrams less than what has still been used in, in a lot of studies. Um, and I often would probably go higher initially for a lot of people, but right now CBD is it's just kind of cost prohibitive to, to do that. And I continually see people benefit at these lower, more modest dosages, 10 to 25 milligrams, two or three times a day. So that's usually in that range, taking consistently uh, for at least three weeks, if not four to six weeks, and you can kind of slowly build up. And then I'll usually have people do some type of inventory, whether it's a symptom questionnaire, 
uh, or something because you often don't remember how you feel when you're either feeling better or worse how you felt a month ago. So um, usually doing some type of scoring questionnaire uh, or just the general journaling to, to get a sense of, of how, you're, how you're feeling and is there benefit, especially if there's not a dominant condition, condition you're treating, uh, then um, it might be hard to really see, do I feel better? but you might do some tracking like sleep. Um, I'm getting more sleep or I'm waking up earlier and feeling more energized or pain better, different things like that. So I think that's a good trial of a, of a CBD product. Absolutely. Eat and move, it's a good call. And again, any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. If you wanna speak or show your face, uh, you can just click uh, something about share video or share audio, something to that. And in the meantime, I'll just kind of add, uh, seeing if there's any other questions, just to kind of reiterate what I said earlier, there, there's no absolutes when it comes to anything in medicine. There's no medicine that's good or bad. Even if when we talk about conventional that quote are backed by hard research or, or what a lot of medical professionals say is, is true evidence, um, they're, they're not necessarily for everybody. So even in a research study, um, often to get a drug approved, you only need to show it helps maybe 20% improvement in about half the patients. So a lot of the drugs, say for example, for pain, fibromyalgia out there, uh, a condition that a lot of people use cannabis for, the drugs that are FDA approved for fibromyalgia in these research studies that cost millions or potentially billions of dollars they showed about a 20% improvement and that's kind of considered the standard of care. And so that's kind of one thing to remember is that none of these treatments are 100%, be it prescription or cannabis. Uh, and so it's really, again, more important to just focus on what am I trying to achieve, start somewhere based on education, based on guidance, and then adapt. Because cannabis itself is not dangerous, but that doesn't mean cannabis is risk-free and it doesn't mean cannabis has no side effects and it doesn't mean cannabis can't be used, uh, I don't wanna say inappropriately, but I would say counterproductively would be uh, uh, a better way of describing it. So people often say, oh, cannabis is bad or marijuana is bad, it causes addiction. Okay, well, that's a blanket statement. It's more kind of fear-mongering. Cannabis addiction is a real thing or what we might call cannabis use disorder can happen anywhere for people smoking or using high dose THC on a daily basis um, and repeatedly it's probably about an eight to ten percent risk that you can become dependent on, on cannabis so that's a real a real number um, but that doesn't mean cannabis is bad it just means if cannabis is not used appropriately it can have side effects I heard a lecture um, by an emergency room physician at a conference uh, a week ago and was really just kind of listing all these negatives about cannabis and and really it was just well if used inappropriately yes cannabis could potentially cause all those things i'm not necessarily sure cannabis causes all of them but i'd say potentially it could but that's not how most people are using cannabis those are the extremes um, so we want to educate people so we don't get to those extremes but i think if you try to scare people with a lot of negatives or on the flip side uh, tell people it's this magic bullet that's going to have no problems and fix everything, uh, those extremes are ex terribly counterproductive. We really want to stress that if you have an issue, cannabis might help, educate yourself, learn how to use it safely and effectively, make adjustments, and, and you're likely going to do well. So the side effects you may hear or the risks about cannabis you may hear often are true in potentially very small numbers of patients but that shouldn't necessarily preclude people from getting more information about it. 
And again, this is just my experience in medicine as a whole. Uh, most of what we consider standard of care, um, even when used appropriately uh, or as prescribed, is far more toxic to the body. It's, and really, that's why I, I started exploring and looking for, for other options. So just some general comments about kind of what often the, the media will say. Another good example, if anybody was reading the, the news that wasn't COVID related or, or uh, election related this uh, past couple of weeks, there was a big article and, and a, big, a bunch of headlines, cannabis terrible for your heart. American Heart Association says cannabis or marijuana is bad for your heart. And really what the American Heart Association published, they reviewed a lot of the data and most of the data they reviewed showed cannabis wasn't dangerous for the heart and in some situations potentially beneficial. Um, but the media kind of picked up on a few comments where they said people should use cannabis cautiously because it could have negative effects on the heart. And, and of course, if you use certain things inappropriately, especially smoking, um, it can have negative effects on the heart. But that's, that was what all the headlines were, but that's not what the American Heart Association said. They were much more balanced and really gave a good overview. They had some uh, areas where they were kind of wrong and they, they kind of hadn't done their research, but for the most part, it was a very well done article. Uh, but again, simply uh, the media likes to take news and, and convert it to what they think is going to be most popular. Uh, obviously, we see that in a lot of areas. Another question, what dosages and which isolate uh, versus full spectrum, are you finding work better for insomnia, especially for early morning awakening? So in general, I would say THC dominant products are going to be better for insomnia. Um, but there's again, a lot of caveats for that. So for certainly for people who are dealing with like post-trauma, nightmares, things like that, uh, THC is absolutely uh, seems to be far and away the most effective. Um, and that can be a full spectrum THC product, but still THC being the dominant chemical there. Dosages, it's a huge range. If you're new to cannabis I, with THC, I still recommend starting with like two and a half milligrams. And every couple of days you can go up. I would say on average, most people end up being between about five and 20 milligrams. Um, but, and usually oral if you're looking at early morning awakening, because if you're going to inhale at 10 o'clock and go to sleep, that's mostly going to be out of your system by two o'clock. So for that early morning awakening, it's not going to be too effective. So typically some type of oral product taken at bedtime is going to be best for early morning awakening. I'd say THC is still probably the, the initial go-to. Ideally something full spectrum that's, that has uh, uh other terpenes and other compounds that tend to be more sedative. So those are often going to be labeled as an indica uh, edible, although those terms don't like to use a lot, but again, they're still used. So we have to, we can't ignore them. Um, the other thing though, I'll often have, you know, what's causing insomnia. A lot of it is just general anxiety or pain in those situations that that's part of the awakening. Uh, then often I'll use a combination THC CBD product also. So one-to-one -one ratio products often still can be very effective as oral products taken at bedtime and, and helping you with early morning awakening. Um, I'd still probably use CBN as a third line. Uh, one is just simply more expensive and two THC uh, indica formulations of THC or one-to-one -one ratios of THC and CBD. Uh, I think just tend to work most of the time, so often don't need to resort to CBN, but that would be a third option. And again, somewhere in the range for most people end up between about five and 20 milligrams, but I still start low with a couple milligrams. And again, I would definitely think oral uh, for early morning awakening issues. I'll just give a sh another shout out to to journaling and not kind of just trying something once and seeing what happens. Simple thing like, hey, I'm having trouble sleeping. I want to try cannabis, uh, whether it's just on the recommendations I just mentioned uh, or even advice from a friend. I'm going to try this. 
nightly for a little while. I'm going to journal. I'm going to say, what time do I go to sleep? What time do I wake up? How do I feel in the morning? Kind of give it a sense. And especially in Colorado, where really anybody can go try cannabis if they're over 21, have to um, have a, a medical consultation first. Again, cannabis can be tried safely, for, you know, just on an adult use standpoint. But if you take notes and journal, I have often people come in, oh yeah, I've been trying this for three months, different products. Those who come in with what they've taken specifically and what they've noticed, uh, those folks uh, were much more likely to get them to a, a great solution uh, first or quicker because we have that data. So really, again, a big believer in journaling. It doesn't, you can, there are apps that you can use, but frankly, a piece of paper works fine as well. So. If you're using cannabis, especially for specific symptoms, definitely track, definitely journal. Um, it's going to help you, uh, but if you end up needing a consultation, it's going to definitely uh, help us get to an answer quicker. So big, uh, big believer in, in journaling. And I think I'm being told that it's 530 and our sessions are ending. So I appreciate all who are, are still there listening. Thanks for joining us. Again, do not hesitate to reach out and call Leaf 411 for all kinds of questions. If you definitely feel like, wow, I really need some direct guidance, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one consultation, uh, absolutely can reach out to my website. Uh, usually about one day a week, I'll, I'll be doing consults and do everything by Zoom now. And frankly, even after COVID, I'll, I, I typically still do a lot of it uh, virtually for just convenience. Uh, so that's an option, but again, so many resources out there and please, please utilize the 411 and, uh, there'll be more information in the expo session. You can, uh, certainly chat some questions, be checking in on it periodically, uh, and, and can reply by chat, but there won't be anything further live going on at this point, uh, in my, in my expo area. So appreciate you guys all, all being here and, and have a great night.